presence to be with us. The Lord presence that has been with us never to leave us. We need His strength for the preaching of the Word of God and to hear the Word that He has for us. The Father, we ask our blessings, the blessings of the Lord that make us great, that make us relevant. Father, we pray that Lord, Your grace will be poured unto us. Ability to hear the word of God. Power to even bring forth the word with clarity. So bless us, we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So we be seated. Please, with your Bibles, let's get ourselves ready for the study of the word of God this morning. We bless God for an opportunity to serve Him this morning. Welcome all of you back into the house of the Lord. I want to continue with my series. I think after this, I have four topics to go. The Lord gave me this series to, to teach. I've done that, I think, from the month of March. And uh, today I'm talking about the virtuous Christian. The concept of virtue in our walk with God. And the whole concept of Christianity, what is virtue? A prayer is that God will bring us clarity and God will pour more unto us today. Beloved, the reason why I believe the Lord gave us this series is for us to be prepared for the coming of the Lord and not so to be able to find our feet and find ourselves in a place where whatever we do, we'll be able to honor the Lord. And at the same time, we are pushed up in the sight of God. The reason is that there are so many things that are fighting against our work with God. So many things that are competing with our understanding due to what is the simple message that God has brought to us. What He gives to us every day. And because of that, many are confused. Before we put it in general, Normally, talk about things that we need to know after salvation. What next? After salvation, do we need uh, to work our lives or, you know, negotiate our lives anyhow? But I think this series has brought us a whole lot of definitions of our lives as it's related to the expectation of Christ. Certain aspects of our lives as we relate to, to what the Bible says, the doctrine of the Bible. We spoke about the abiding Christian, how do we abide in him? We spoke about the benevolent Christian, not just giving alone, but there are certain areas that God expects us to do. What is the commitment aspect of your, your, your work with God? And so, taking out some of these topics helps us to be able to understand who we are. Number one, as Christians. Number two, it also helps us to evaluate ourselves whether we are growing in understanding or we are just uh, flowing through. There are people who flow through, they flow through what Christianity is all about. It's a matter of getting up. When we talk about prayer, prayer is something that we just go through, talk to God, and they just talk to God without a purpose. And it's also, it doesn't matter what happens. What we do will be. You know, picking up some of these topics helps us to be able to understand who we are and what we need to know concerning our work with God. So may the Lord help us this morning as we talk about some of these things. I pray that God will give us more insight. And I'm putting all this into a manual. It's a big manual. I am on page number. 357 since I started. 357. I'm on in the letter V. The virtue of Christian. The concept of virtue in our work with God. Amen. I want us to understand a few things when we talk about virtue. There are certain demands on us, there are certain expectations. That comes with our work with God. Ancient philosophers came out with a lot of things that they live with. But most of us read through and realize that most of them were trying to speak out of their minds 
how they saw things and how they perceived things. Is that related to what the scripture says? Many great philosophers came out with what we call moral excellence. In fact, the word Becky denotes what we call moral excellence, which is expected of every Christian to walk with God in some of these virtues and some of these things that God has given to us. These are qualities that is expected of us. Those of us who have been talk about Christian nobility. Christian nobility, there is a place where we see nobility of a Christian. I also spoke about the integrity part of your work with God. These are quality lifestyles that God expects us to cultivate. God expects us to work with Him not just as people that will not understand or will not. What is something that God demands from us? In other words, there are certain things that the Lord has given to us as a watchman. And these are principles that God has given to us in the book called Bible. The Bible gives us standards, gives us an area where we don't just do our things in the high, but we, 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 we do it by the demands of what has been written here. And so the Christian tries very hard to walk according to what the scripture says, not what his mind or somebody is saying. I'm telling you to say that there are so many philosophies in the world today. All these things, you can look at them and some will be sound if you don't take care. It will sound very good, but my knowledge will really be the, 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 the standard or the written code or some of the things that God has access to do. In my study, I found out that, you know, somebody like, you know, Pluto, Socrates, People like, you know, you know, ancient philosophers that I just mentioned came out with something. And they expected that human beings would live according to what they have said. You know that we came to rest upon the scriptures or the very word that God gave to us. That some people today, after much, acquiring much knowledge, believe that they must live on the philosophy of other people. And they ignore the demands of what the scripture has given to us. Beloved, what makes us Christians is the fact that God has given us a standard, a scriptural standard. When we talk about Christ, then we became followers of Christ because we, we were like Him. The earlier persons behaved like Him, lived like Him, talked like Him. And therefore, they earn the name Christians. So it's not about anybody philosophy or human generated philosophy. It has to do with Christian biblical standards. The term virtue, and, and before going that, we, we don't want to talk about things that are good virtues. And I've heard people who say, but this is not a virtue, this is not. You know, you know, good virtue. In other words, the word virtue then it denotes what we call quality, which is the demands of the scripture. God expects us to lead a life that is unblemished, a holiness, life that He has given to us so that as we walk with Him, we will try to follow the steps that He has given to us. Beloved, we have come to this world. We are living in this world. We will live out of this world. Now, as we are here, we are being managed. Those of us who have really subscribed to the faith, and we are Christians who call ourselves Christians who walk with the Lord, have been given the word of God, and this word of God is serving as a standard, a yardstick, on everything that we do. 
So if we talk about forgiveness, for instance, you are a Christian. Number one, you are a Christian. And therefore, you subscribe to whatever thing that God has given to us. So forgiveness should not be something that you negotiate. Are you, are you getting me? You don't negotiate. It's a demand. It is there in the scripture. Bible says, forgive and you shall be forgiven. And if you trust this word, and if you believe in the word of God, what God has given to us is a virtue, it's a quality of a standard that God has given to us. So you don't struggle to forgive. As you walk with God for years, you ask the Spirit of God to help you so that these qualities that we are talking about, you cultivate them not in a day, but gradually you embrace them, you, you, you really build them, and you really allow them to speak to you. So, even as you are giving yourself 20 years now, I expect that there are a lot of struggles that you have gone through, and that we have been wondering, beloved, you will struggle through forgiving, you struggle, struggle through this, struggle through that. But as time goes on, as time goes on, you seek to now settle on certain things. I have people saying that, that I'm praying that God will give me a heart to forgive. Okay, five years ago you told me this, and I expect that today. I expect that today you have overcome that. If you are still struggling to forgive, then there is a problem. Come on, you come over here. And there is a problem. Listen to me. I believe that my calling is not to do that on spiritual gifts alone. We don't build church with spiritual gifts. We build church with the word of God. Every man of God that I've been called leads you to a place where after much teaching, much information given to you, and after much prayer, you bring out the best. What the Bible talks about in Galatians, which is the fruit of the Spirit, you build them. The embodiment of all these truths and all the good things that God has given to us in the book of First Peter, we're going to read much of all the, the things that God has given. It's what we call Christian virtue. These are virtues, qualities, moral standards that have been planned by God. God expects it to manifest in you. We have struggle. Come back to married, married couples. You are a Christian. You are giving your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus rules you. He rules your marriage. Of course. The demand is that women or men say, wives have the expectation, biblical expectation of them that God expects them to to cultivate or have it so that it will manifest in their work with God. Part of what you do is the first thing, Christian. But there are other tributaries. You are a Christian wife. What is expected you of you as a Christian wife? Number one. What is expected of you as a Christian mother? Number two. What is expected of you as a Christian member of a church? Who you are a Christian, you are a member of a church, relationship to friends and other things, come over to pray. I that you So, you go to the Bible and God expects you to submit to your own husband. Submit to your own husband. And the second demand is that God has put there. You study them and you act on them. You do them because you love God. Because you are a Christian. The Christian husband. Husband, love your wife. So you do things that you will cause you to love your wife, even if you don't know how to do it. And then you pray that God give me a heart to love my wife. So if you don't understand, you go to God and ask Him, How do you, do you want me to love my wife? So you learn as the child of God. I'm saying this and breaks my heart to say that 50% of Christian marriages are on rock today. 50%. The latest in America. 
50% of people who married according to the principles of the scripture have all been divorced. And about 30% are still studying and trying to make a decision whether they should stay in or not. We must study and realize that uh, if we say we love the Lord, we must obey His commandments. That means that patience brings us to a place to say that I don't love like the way you behave. But that's not to say that I'm getting out of the marriage. But to say that let's all sit down and let's work out. Because you see, people, two people from different backgrounds come together and begin to share their life together. Let me give you less of a 20 years. It will take you about 20 years to be able to adapt. It will take you about 20 years. And you will enjoy yourself through the 20 years because, number one, you came in not as a saint. You came in with your bearings also. And therefore, we all bring our bearings back on the table and we carry the bearings back to the cross. We ask the Lord to please help us. I love my wife. I love my husband. But please help us. I don't like the way he talks to me. I don't like the way he behaves. But Lord, help us. I can still enjoy my wife. I can still enjoy my husband. Even as the bedding is still there and we are taking it to the cross. And as we go along, we break them little by little. We break them little by little. We break them little by little. See, a lot of these things have become clear to this. We pray and make and we worry as if we pray for all these things, that many people will come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have limited the prayer to certain things that we should have dealt with in the house of God, according to the word of God. We have written that are broken, and, and little, little things we should now pray and cultivate the power to heal, power to demonstrate the power of God. Now we have limited to unimportant things. Pastors have now limited all these to pray for certain members that they will serve the Lord. Let me do that. If you don't want to serve him, it's on you. If you want to serve the Lord, make a decision today. And that's what Joshua said. He said, make up your decision today. If you serve the Lord, let me know. If you don't want to serve the Lord, it's on you. He says, but as for me in my house, we have decided to serve the Lord. I love it. As for me in my house, I have no way going because he's done, this man has done me too good. Hallelujah. Do I have a witness here? It's going to be too good. Good things have I seen. You know that I need to encourage somebody. Keep praying. Don't let them say what I mean. The fact is God. The God is too good. It's too good. I love it. It's too good. If only you can come. You see, I love the mercy part of God. The grace part of God. You don't come to him because you are righteous. You come to him because you are broken. And as you come, you submit yourself to him and say, Lord, look at me. Not justice, but mercy. Lord, I am not here to justify anything. Because if you don't I think it's going to be good. So I, don't, I don't come here for justice. I come, I came in for mercy. Oh, hallelujah. One of aspects of the doctrine is that most of the things that we need will be done to you by grace. And if you stand and say, I don't have what it takes, you go to God in prayer. You will be empowered. Apostle Paul, with many witnesses, stood for the Lord, a philosopher, who believed in many things, but when God met him, he was a changed person. And he learned how to depend upon the Lord. One day he came back to say, I can do all things through Christ. Not Apostle Paul, my mind anymore, my knowledge anymore. When it comes to a Jew, I am a real Jew. When it comes to philosophy, I have learned everything that you need to know about Judaism. But I've come to a place to know that I can do all things through Christ who can have the strength. They will not give you the strength today. I praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, I say hallelujah. So the term virtue in Greek often refers to moral excellence, as I've just said, or goodness. And study under what a man called Asta F. Holmes, who describes 
vet you in the following way. Listen to what he says. A virtue is a right inner disposition, and a disposition is a tendency to act a certain way. This position is more basic, lasting and pervasive than the particular motive or intention behind a certain action. Listen to this. It is a default from a sudden impulse in being a settled habit of mind, an internalized and often reflective trait. That is a general character trait that provides inner something on our particular motives, intentions, and outward conduct. You know, let me sum up what the man has said. Listen to this. There are certain things that we 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 perceive within. Don't be saying that a man acts out of things that is in abundance of the heart. The Bible puts it says, in the abundance of the heart proceeds of the mouth. So man is such that we don't do things of impulse. We don't do things by just rushing through it. But somebody doesn't like you. It, 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 it occurs to him somewhere. He thinks about what he wants to do against you. And, and that brings him to a place where he decides that I don't like you. So when he sees you, because it has ministered to him and the heart has agreed that he doesn't like you, the moment that you cross his heart, he thought he's dead. It's not just because he crossed his heart that he says he doesn't like you. And that's what the Bible is saying we must be very careful because what gets in there is more dangerous. Because when you are can walk with, you can walk with a friend. And I'm not talking about Christian friends, I'm talking about worldly friends. Friend. He may have a different idea about you, thinking about how to follow you. But they put up their mouth and a face. You must laugh and you all laugh and everything is good. No, no, no. But the heart is far away. But I don't describe this in a way. It says it's like a dead man's tomb. This has been white walls. But when you get there in there, there are rotten bones in there. So, some of the things that we are learning here are helping us to understand that. Let what you have in your head correspond with your action. Hello? That is to say that my heart is more important as a Christian than as a child of God. God deals with our heart. I've heard people talk about the fact that the motive of doing something is more important than just the action. And also, let me also say this. Somebody will say, well, I have some good intentions for you, but I will do something bad against you. And God knows that my heart is right. No, 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 no. If you have good motives, let it manifest. Because a man cannot become duplicity or duplicity or duality. You cannot live two lives at the same time. So God expects that as you come to Him, you come the way you are, and you live the way you are. I filled myself with, with, with a philosophy, if you please. And I said that if you tell me the thing is blue, I will never doubt you. But if the thing is green, and you told me blue, it's, it's on you. Hello? I, I, I can't show people. Well, I've really built as a philosophy in all my pastoral duty is that when I sit with somebody and the person tells me the thing is blue, I will never doubt the person. No, no, no. That is it. Because I want to trust you. Because if I can't trust you, I cannot trust you. That's my philosophy. If I can't bring you up in the things of God by trusting you, and I doubt you, and I, and I, and I, and I will doubt everybody that comes to me. So I expect that every child of God, and the key word here that qualifies you is the child of God. That tells me the thing is blue. I agree with you. Thank you very much. It's blue. What was the day before you said, Do you love him? Do you want to marry him? Yes, I want to marry him. Do you want to lose him or you want to marry him? I want to marry him. But if the difference, I mean, the motive is different. 
I leave you with God. Hallelujah. So there are a lot that we look at. It has to do with inner life. Inner life. That stems from what your core value is in a certain scriptural way. As you have studied the word of God and daily, you are walking with God. God expects that you live the life that brings the good out of you, a habit that is cultivated. A habit that is cultivated. It brings out nothing but the quality life that God has given to you. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So, so, so Bible wants us to understand that there are a lot of things that if you are a child of God, you must cultivate. Go with me to the book of Philippians, chapter number 4, verse 8. The book of Philippians, chapter number 4. That's my, 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 my basic or my premise of scripture. You think it's a family brethren. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. Whatever things are true, opening it, breaking it, and looking for the true value of whatever you find yourself in. Nobility. See to it that your lifestyle is set way in a certain in, in a set manner where it is not nothing but bring the best with gentleness, with nobility. So think about it. Whatever is just simplicity. Whatever will bring the true the truthfulness of something. Whatever is pure, purity. Whatever is lovely, lovely. There are some things that are so lovely. Somebody says that you see good is so lovely. And when you are pre- putting your hands together for the person, do it well. When you are appreciating the person, appreciate the person well. It's lovely. Learn. Don't be a person who always at all. Fight any good thing that comes to anybody or even comes to you. There are some people they have a lifestyle. Even if the best is coming to them, they say, no, 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 they can't come to me. Please. They can come to you. Christianity does not put us in a, a, a place where we cannot enjoy life that God has given to us. The loveliness of life, love, pleasantness of life, brings us to a place where you have to take your family to a place of vacation, enjoy life, scenery, go to a place by the riverside and watch it and see the birds flying and, and look at what is happening. It, it revives you. The scenery revives you. Walk through the woods. Walk through some woods. I'm not, I'm not going about deeper woods. There are some people who become motivated by watching the trees and going around and meditating. Lovely. Lovely. Lots things are of good report. Is there anything that will bring the best of good report? We want to do things. He says, think about these things. If there is any virtue in all these things that we have spoken about, then find time and meditate on them. Hallelujah. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. From verse number one. Second Peter one one. 
the son of Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Our philosophers found peace in things that we have never thought of. We believe that if you can think of something, if you can really put one or two things together, it will give you peace. But we receive peace or we derive our peace from, what, from Jesus Christ and what the Lord has given to us. This is grace and peace be multiplied to you. It was a prayer that Peter was given to his, his audience. And he says the knowledge of God, through the knowledge of God and of our Jesus Christ, you know, and his divine power that has given to us as all things that pertain to life and godliness. Divine power has given us everything pertaining to what? Life and godliness. His divine power, not your power, but divine power. That is where you don't deserve anything, but God gives you power to attain it. Where you don't know that it's going to come to you, but God opens up a door for you. Where you have never, you know, you know related to anything or blessing or a particular blessing that has come to you. But God, by way of divine application, brings it to you. You see, by that divine power, He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life and godliness. To lead a godly life, God has given you power to do so. Divinely, He will empower you to live a godly life. You see, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Who called us by glory and virtue. The Lord has called us by His glory and has given us quality of life to our moral excellence to live by through the knowledge of Him. Nobody can become morally sound if he does not depend upon the Word of God. Listen to me, if you give your life to Jesus, one of the things that the Lord will do when you become born again is inner transformation. He gives you power from within, from inside out. So I am born again, and I'm living in the best of the blessed thing that God has done is that from the day that I gave my life to Jesus, whatever target, whatever trap, whatever thing the devil did concerning my, my lifestyle, the Lord gave me power now to say that I can do all things. So you can rise up and say that I can overcome the sin of fornication, I can overcome the sin of thievery, I can overcome the sin of this and the sin of that. I can overcome these things because you are born again, you have been transformed. Power has been given to you to stand in and overcome these evil things by the enemy has led us to bring to your life. Therefore, by which we have been it has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Now through these you may be partakers of divine nature. Oh my goodness. Hallelujah. Precious promises that God has given to us. So that we become, become partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Corruption. You will escape the corruption. That's what I'm talking about. You will escape all this corruption. That comes out of lust. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You will overcome all these things because the Lord has given you great and precious promises through Him. Through your born again experience, he gives you a divine nature. Somebody will say that I in my old bad days. I want to describe it as good old days. It wasn't that there was nothing good to it. Because I heard people with that say that he would have said that, you know, good old days. What is good about the old days? Good, bad, you know, bad old days. A Christian should not say that, oh, good old days, we used to do this. No, 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 no. No, no. God has given you a new life. And you being a good Christian must enjoy the new life that God has given to you. In fact, if you are not enjoying the new life, then there is something wrong with you. Hallelujah. Have you thought of the peace that God brings to you? There are a lot of people who are not born again, but they cannot sleep. Oh my goodness, they cannot sleep. Because they think by sleeping they will be dying. So, what do you, what do you, what do you, can you, can you just protect? Just think all life. If God has never protected, they can be protected by your own power. Some also 
no matter what, they think them, think them, think them, think them, think them, that something bad is going to happen to them. What the Lord does is that when the Lord calls you, when the Lord gives you the power to live for Him, He gives you the power to depend on Him. You can sleep and sleep somewhere. Praise God. Knowing that the one who called you is faithful, He will take care of you. Oh, praise God. You can rise up in the morning after prayer to have faith in that. One of the good things that God brings to us as a virtue is when you pray with faith. You know that with faith you have inner assurance that you go and come back quickly. Not because you are a special person, but because you have a God that who in whom you have trust or trusted. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the living God. Continue. I don't I don't ask you to stop. Why? If I'm not telling you about me, if I want to go to my Bible, I will get to it. Okay. Praise God. Something is wrong. Right. Okay. Give me five. But also for the very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith. Now that is this part that I want you to look at. Given all to diligence. Diligent Christian. A diligent Christian is the one who is very thoughtful. It's a man who or a woman who does not do things anyhow. He keeps to his schedule or her schedule. He's very Thoughtful of whatever he does, he's very purposeful. He's adding to that, God to faith, virtue, to virtue, add knowledge. And to knowledge, self control. And one of the things that God does to us as a virtue is the spirit of knowledge and self control. Spirit of knowledge, understanding information, getting information. And also understanding what we call self control, controlling situations, being temperate, understanding things, being thoughtful before you act, thinking about a lot of things before you do it. To self control is this act of perseverance, give long room to be able to deal with situations. Don't act on, you know, causes. Don't just be quick to, to make conclusions. Make few conclusions. Give yourself much time. Understanding your wife, your husband, in the discussion, in the conversation. You who do not have a heart for to accommodate things, one of the things that the Lord will do is when Jesus comes into your life, He gives you power to persevere in the face of hard situations, in the face of of, of unbearable situations, it gives you power to persevere. When the enemy will rise against you, you know that at the end of it all, the Lord is going to manifest himself in a mighty way. So you keep persevering. It's very difficult for a Christian to live in a life of perseverance. Listen to me. In the heart seat is beating you. Everything from every side is beating you. You know, people are making mockery of you. People are saying the whole lot of things about you. But it is expected of you as a child of God to persevere. We don't give up. Hallelujah. So we persevere, perseverance, good one, godliness. Hello? Godliness, very, very important. Godliness. The godliness, brotherly kindness. The brotherly kindness, love. The godliness, which is a life. Of godliness. In other words, the first DOD talks about living a godly life, living like God. Brotherly kindness. It has to do with consideration of being there to help. Then he talks about charity, which is love. Charity. Available to help and to bless everybody that comes your way. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 says, And now these three things remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. 
Because we recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, give it to me. Faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope is a vacuum that underlines and the love everything that God has given to us. It builds us on this. Let me, let me end with this. The word faith has to do with you coming to God and trusting with confidence that the Lord who called you is able to make it happen. And so you have God in you, and when you encounter certain things, number one, you are on the way to heaven. You are building up your soul to heaven. You trust in God that if the enemy brings anything around you, for instance, sickness and other things, you can trust God that as the Lord is leading you to that place, He will give you power to overcome these little things that have come to intertwine and the, the, the plan of God and to frustrate you and to frustrate the plan of God. Faith is very needed in your life as a vacuum. Faith. Everything hinges on faith. Nobody has ever seen God. Because of the trust and confidence you have in Him, you were able to rise up this morning and you are here. And you are here by faith. Come on. I say you are here by faith. You have trust in this God. You know that God will speak to you when you are here by faith. Hope. Knowing that I have an expectation. And even as the things have come against me and I'm battling so many things, I have a hope, I have an expectation that it will be well. So the expectation brings us to a place and it brings faith in us. Expectation gives us a hope that I'm waiting for the Lord to bless me and to suddenly give me what I've asked for. But my hope in Him is that one day it shall happen. And that is the place that is joy in you. One day God will give me the promises that He has given to me and it shall be fulfilled. My hope, my expectation, and love. Love has to do with the agape kind of love, which is the love that I have for him, the love that I have for my family, the love that I have for my fellow brethren. We live in these three things. Amen. Faith, hope, and love. Say it with me. Say it again. These are best things that God has given to us. Time will not permit me to go through some of the things that I've written here. But let me encourage you in the book of First Thessalonians, chapter number 1, to 3, says, because we could recall of the presence of our God the Father, your work of faith and labor of love and endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 5, 5 to 6, it says, for through the spirit by faith, we wait expectantly for the hope of righteousness. And by faith, we wait expectantly for the hope of righteousness. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither the confession nor all the confession carries any weight. The only thing that matters is faith working through love. Amen. Wait. It, it does not matter who calls himself the grand, grand, grand son or the grand daughter of God. Some people, they will never see God love with them more, more than anybody. When they say things, it is from the scripture. But they want you to know that we, we know how. No, 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 no. We all go through everything that everybody's going through. But we will sustain through by the grace of God. Come on, is it not by faith? Shouldn't we all believe in the Lord through faith? Don't we all expect God to bless us through hope? Expectation. Then the last one has to do with love. Do you love Him? Come on, do you love Him? Stand on your feet and let's bless the Lord. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord.